the opportunity in this session. Uh, Dr. Maria Fernanda uh, actually is the one that was going to, to make this presentation. She wasn't able to come and ask if I would present her materials. So uh, any credits should go to Maria. Any of, any of the, the negative comments, you can blame me <laughs> on that. Had the opportunity of working with Maria since 2012, so the last eight or nine years or seven years. We had the opportunity of working in Guatemala on uh, sugarcane, bananas, and uh, coffee nutrition. Also uh, worked in Brazil and Argentina on sugarcane and, and the, uh, some of the disease problems as well as just nutritional problems there. So I feel honored at being able to share this information with you. Maria titled it, uh, Mind the Gap. In other words, we know what our production is now. But if you realize that what our production is now is only about 25% of the genetic potential of this crop. Sugar cane's a very uh, dynamic crop. It's a C4 crop. It has the capacity to uh, produce probably uh, eight times what we're actually producing in some of our best production uh, uh, circumstances if we looked at if, if we looked at uh, the actual genetic uh, biochemistry of, of the sugarcane plant it's it's a remarkable plant and so when people say well Gee, we're going to run out of food as our population grows. It's, uh, the only thing we're running out of is the mental desire and capacity to meet those needs because the potential is there uh, with our only achieving uh, 25 at the most 30 percent of the genetic potential of any of our crops. And so as Maria has said, we want to fill the gap from that, what we're achieving now, to what we can actually know that we can achieve. And we're not going to do it overnight, but we can do it in steps as we learn a little more in the biochemistry and the uh, management uh, from a nutrient standpoint. And so uh, give you a little overview on uh, what we'll cover uh, a little bit on just nutrients in general, nutrient uh, requirements, effective uh, some of the practices on nutrient availability or herbicides in our uh, burning and some of the other common practices. If you understand how those relate from a nutritional standpoint, all of you know from a management standpoint, some of the benefits there may not know some of the downsides, but if we can compensate for those downsides, then we can make those tools much more powerful for us <clears throat> in producing this crop. And so we'll look at the soil analysis recommendations and some of the ways that we can determine the nutrient needs of the crop at different developmental stages so that we can really optimize that nutrition. Uh, have uh, a new tool that's just recently become available to us, the portable x-ray fluorescence uh, tools that are made now by two companies uh, and price keeps dropping so it's getting more usable. It's estimated that probably within as little time as five years that will replace most of the laboratory analyses that are now uh, done for nutrient analysis. And that's because it doesn't take the preparation uh, or anything. It gives you all of your nutrients from sodium to uranium on the periodic table. That whole array of nutrients gives it to you in 30 seconds after you put a leaf on the, across the beam line. It's really a phenomenal uh, technique. 
I started working on that at Brookhaven Laboratories uh, about 30 years ago, but it cost uh, about five billion dollars for the piece of equipment that we used to to do that and it's now down to 30 or 35 thousand dollars which is still uh, more than my wife would trust me with <laughs> but still a lot better than 150,000 or 250,000 for an ICPAA or a mass spec type of a unit that we rely on now so uh, we're getting those tools so that you can mine that gap. In other words, you can bridge the gap between what you're able to do now and fill in that gap with some of the potential, express that potential uh, overwork uh, better. So that we'll look at uh, Liebig's Law and sugarcane nutrition, recognize that they're uh, this is just part of the story, but as Liebig likened it to having a barrel, and the barrel could hold only as much as the lowest stake, with each one of those stakes in the barrel being uh, a particular nutrient, so the yield and the ability of the plant to respond to, the, to your fertilizer program is going to be dependent on what the lowest stake was. And if you brought that stake up a little ways up to the next one, you would be able to shorten that uh, gap or improve your, your response to it. It has some, uh, doesn't quite explain all of the relationships, but it's a good starting point so that we have sufficiency tables with sufficiency levels for sugar cane and our other crops, and they'll usually have a large range in there, maybe uh, uh, 50 parts per million manganese, for instance, to 400 parts per million, and say, well, where should I be? Well, you know that you need to be at least at 50 parts per million, and then it depends on your other management opportunities and the soil and the environment that you're in. I'll point some of those out with the uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, and your other nutrients on how it influences where you and your management program should be relative to your fertilizer nutrient supply program. So, but Liebig's law of the minimum uh, says that growth is dictated not by the total resources available, but by the scarcest resource as the limiting factor. Now, there are other things to consider in, in relationship to this. Also, the relationship of specific nutrients to other nutrients, because they will, almost all of them will influence one way or another the uptake of other nutrients. So we use Calcium, for instance, to suppress potassium uptake in maize where potassium is excessive. The reason for suppressing it early is that high potassium, excessive potassium, will <coughs> shorten the kernel primordia, number of kernel primordia that develop. We want all of them to develop that we can. So we need to hold potassium down early on in the growth stage of the, of the maize plant. But then after that kernel primordia are laid down on the ear, we want all of the potassium we can get because potassium's involved in that osmotic regulation and movement of, of nutrients and carbohydrates into the kernel. So that we will use or calcium then, uh, three or 400 pounds of gypsum or, or even lime, depending on our pH, and it will suppress potassium uptake enough so that it doesn't interfere with kernel primordia formation. And then that relationship through growth is pretty well utilized that calcium so that your balance shifts down and then you have all of that potassium that's available for other stages. Well, in sugar cane, you're not interested in, in flowering, and then uh, you want to harvest it before flowering, before seed set, because 
What happens if you don't? What happens to your sugar content? It goes down, doesn't it? And that's because that photosynthetic material that, that would normally go into the stalk of sugar for storage, because it doesn't have the seed developing early, is now going into the seed for storage rather than into the stalk. And so you want to harvest before. You want all of that energy as you're capturing the sun's energy through photosynthesis to form sugar that you can store then as sugar or with a little nitrogen from the soil or from the air to also uh, uh, be stored as, as protein. So you manipulate that relationship and sometimes we'll use herbicides or other materials, modus or other materials, as a ripening agent to kind of shunt it more into the uh, stalk, that sugar into the stalk, rather than into the flowering parts of the plant, try and suppress flowering to, and maximize the storage capacity. Well, we do that by changing the ratios of some of these nutrients. and. Uh, get into that ripening phase, but there are different stages in the sugarcane plant where it has some modifications in nutrient needs that can make a big difference in what you harvest as sugar. And whether you're harvesting it as sugar or whether it's going to go into the, uh, uh, just stay as sucrose and glucose rather than being crystallized out as the sucrose that you want. But Liebig's um, law of the minimum, again, is a good starting point for us to recognize what those minimum levels are and what that, uh, how that relates to our potential. So we can look at the uh, nutrient requirements that we have for sugar cane, and you'll see that with the macronutrients are required in large quantities, so we measure them as percent of the tissue. For the micronutrients, we rely on the, uh, it's a smaller amount that's required because these are your activators and your regulators for the physiologic processes where your macronutrients become, some of them very important regulators, but, all, but they're also part of the composition of the, plant, the cell walls and uh, the binding agents with calcium and magnesium and a number of those things uh, there. But you see that range in here with all of them from phosphorus 0.18 to 0.3% of the uh, composition of the plant. Well, it's a pretty good size range and then you get over to micronutrients and you're looking at zinc 20 to 100 manganese 25 to 400, uh, on bananas that goes up to 4,000, from uh, 100 to 4,000 for that range on bananas. Very high requirement for manganese. We don't, don't usually uh, find soils, some of the volcanic soils, you'll have levels that will get you there, but uh, so we manage the environment the soil biology, the water table, the water levels, uh, moisture levels, and we manage manganese by uh, water management. In Hawaii, where we have uh, a monsoon season, similar to what you have, and a, a dry season, during the monsoon season, before, just before it sets in, we tell them to get out with some gypsum or some lime, get the calcium there to suppress the manganese uptake because otherwise it'll be toxic under those conditions. And the dry season then, where you have not much solubility and a very limited bio soil biology relative to the biological cycle for manganese, we tell them to irrigate, make it more available. And so we manage it. Uh, we do the same thing in bananas with that very high requirement. We manage it quite often with our 
through our irrigation, through our uh, water management. But you can see those ranges. Now where, where you should be on this range is going to depend on your soil type, depend on the genetics of the uh, variety that you're growing, on its efficiency, and a number on your weather conditions, a number of conditions are going to influence that. But it'll also be very critically influenced by the herbicide that you're using. So that in Guatemala two years ago, they had a new herbicide, applied it, the plants all turned white, they stayed there, they weren't dying, but they turned white for about, uh, for the first three weeks and they just sat there. Well, <clears throat> we were losing three weeks growth, three weeks of sugar production. And uh, we went out, did some tissue samples. We didn't have the background on this new herbicide. I forget which one it was now, but, didn't, but uh, our analysis said, well, you're really short deficient in magnesium and manganese. Well, if we'd have used some of the other herbicides, we wouldn't have had to worry about those two because they didn't chelate magnesium and manganese, but this new one gave us almost an albino plant, a white plant, uh, <clears throat> and that's why it was white was because of the tie-up of magnesium and manganese, shut down chlorophyll production. And, uh, as soon as we got out with a foliar application, in three days everything was green and it took off like gangbusters. But for three weeks of production, we lost a tremendous amount of sugar production in that three week period, especially in the early development of the sugar cane plant. You'll find that even though you restore a lot of that uh, deficient nutrient later, you don't recover 100% of the yield potential that you would have had if it had never had that deficiency to start with. So it's important to, to mind that gap right from early ratoon or right from planting stage, early development, to maximize the potential of that crop uh, on it. And that's why you'll see that range. So if you're using a uh, 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 ripener four or five weeks before harvest. That ripener is there for a purpose. It's chelating certain nutrients so that it shifts the balance so that you stop flowering or you stop uh, stem elongation or tillering. Notice it's a gibberellin inhibitor so that you stop your, your tillering stage. Well, then you want to do that because at that stage of growth, you already have the factory built. You want the factory to fill the stock with sugar. You don't want to grow a bigger factory because you don't have time to fill it. So that you want to stop that uh, tiller growth. Well, glyphosate as a ripener moves right down systemically into the tiller, into the, the uh, buds so that you stop bud growth. Uh, with modus, you stop stem elongation. With ethylene, you stop your, your uh, hormonal, your auxin system so that uh, you're not stimulating that new cell growth to add to the factory, but you're trying to get everything from photosynthesis stored as sugar in the stock for you so you can harvest it. So that determines uh, where you are in that range. So that uh, there are different factors that modify the need for a specific nutrient. Certainly the genetics of the plant, what the percent sugar is, what the tonnage potential is for it. Uh, it's 120 or 180 ton per hectare whether it's 14% uh, uh, sugar or whether it's 18 or 19% sugar. And uh, those are all genetic characteristics as the genetics is influenced by the nutrition. 
So nutrition is the kind of the primary emphasis that that will place on that, but you have to have the genetics to capitalize on that genetics. Again, I mentioned that growth stage, uh, vegetative versus reproductive. So we harvest before it flowers whenever we can, uh, weather permitting usually, but uh, uh, because we want that tremendous amount of energy that's used in flowering at that shift in vegetative stage to the reproductive stage, you have a lot of physiological changes in that plant that influence the amount of sugar that you're going to get out of the mill. So your soil type and condition will influence nutrient availability and nutrient uh, release or nutrient tie-up. Certainly moisture content uh, going to be a big factor there and your soil biology. As I mentioned uh, yesterday and earlier this morning with the when we're farming we're really managing an ecology. And I depicted it as that diamond where you have the plant up at the top, you have the abiotic or the chemical and physical environment over at one side at one point. You have the dynamics of the biology at the bottom and then you have your stresses and, and diseases and pests over on that other point. And then it's how those four points interact that determine what you take to the mill and get out of the mill in that area. So that biology becomes very important for us. Your nutrient source, inorganic or organic or uh, its solubility, its valence state, uh, manganese and iron can only be used in the MN2 plus valence state if it goes to MN3 plus or the FE3 plus or MN4 plus. It's not available to the plant. It's just a piece of gravel sitting there in the intercellular space or the, the cell and the tissue that the plant can't utilize physiologically. Uh, and then how we manage our overall system is going to have a big influence on those nutrients. So if we look at the nutrients, you can see the essential nature of them with nitrogen. It's critical for the nucleic acids, for your DNA, for your genetics and your function there. For your enzymes, 80% of your nitrogen in a sugarcane plant is as protein as enzymes. You'll have some other amino acids, free amino acids and protein, but 80% as those enzymes, those are the engines that do the work for you. And so 50% of that, those enzymes are in just two enzymes. And those are Rubisco and Pep carboxylase. So those two enzymes are what are involved in capturing the sun's energy and making sucrose, making uh, sugars. And then you need the manganese to split the water to combine with the, carbi with the uh, carbon dioxide, but you also need manganese then to combine the fructose and glucose to make the sucrose. So all of those nutrients are important, but Nitrogen is probably number one as far as your overall yield potential. If you get too much nitrogen, then you also get out of balance and you see that you stimulate more growth. You're building a bigger factory rather than storing the sugar. Uh, and with phosphorus, again, it's in your new Part of your nucleic acid, your whole energy system in the plant, required for cell division and uh, for assimilation of a lot of the nutrients. Potassium is cofactor for about 50 enzymes. It's uh, our influence is about 50. It's not a component of any of the plant parts. So it's not a component of the enzyme, but it's a regulator of the enzyme. And so very important for protein synthesis to build, uh, have these 
uh, engines available in the plant to develop the photosynthetic there and for osmoregulation for the osmotic relations in the plant. Uh, in the past, most of the emphasis has been placed on N, P, and K. But if you don't have calcium and magnesium and sulfur, you're not able to utilize that N, P, and K very efficiently. Calcium and magnesium are uh, involved in the stability of the cell wall, protecting it from pathogens and from degradation. You have uh, uh, magnesium that's also involved in that uh, uh, pectin binding in the cell wall. You have nitrogen that's about 14% of your cell wall as carbohydrate protein complexes that protect your pectin and your cellulose from degradation by a lot of the organisms that would otherwise give you the soft rots. If you don't have sulfur, you're not going to have any protein because the sulfur amino acids are involved in starting protein formation, the cysteine and methionine. So if you have, don't have protein, you're going to be short on your enzymes again. Very important uh, uh, from that standpoint. And also uh, your nitrate reductase so that not only have to have the sulfur, but you also have to have uh, molybdenum for your reduction of nitrate back to ammonia to the amine to form the amino acid then for utilization in the, in the proteins. So these are critical elements. You see the same thing, uh, cri critical nature of the micronutrients. In uh, Indiana in 1960, we were taking our soil tests and we said, we have enough micronutrient for corn and soybean productions for about 60 years before we'll have to start worrying about it. Some, uh, sometimes uh, some of those soils, we said, well, it's about a 50 year uh, storage that we have in the bank and the soil. So we probably won't see a lot of deficiencies for about 50, possibly 60 years. That depends on our management. And we started seeing in 35 years, we started seeing a deficiency in many of our soils, especially with soybeans with a high manganese requirement, or you would see it with bananas and sugarcane uh, here uh, for that where you have that high sugar production that you want, uh, we would see it then in about 30 years. Now we still had some areas where we were concerned about manganese toxicity. You have a kind of a narrow window, relatively narrow window between sufficiency or deficiency and, and uh, toxicity on manganese, a very narrow window on boron. In sugarcane, you have a high boron requirement, but you also have the potential, if you overdo it, to have some toxicity. And so it's a matter of that balance, but you have to have your zinc is required along with boron for the uh, uh, regulating the permeability of your cell walls. So that if you have a deficiency of zinc, the cell wall becomes very leaky and you start losing the sugar and the amino acids and the phenolic compounds, start leaking out of the cell, it can't hold them then as it normally should and starts running out of the root system. Well, as you get all of that nutrient running out of the root system in large quantities, as you see with uh, zinc deficiency, then you start stimulating some of your pathogens, your phytophthora, your pythium, and those organisms, even fusarium, because a lot of your pathogenic fusaria are dormant in the soil as chlamydospores. Their dormancy, though, is dependent on bacteria that are eating up all of the 
nutrients that are moving out of that spore that it needs to germinate. With Phytophthora and Pythium, they're attracted directly to the source of exudation. So you get your root rots and your crown rots uh, coming in on it when you have a deficiency of zinc and boron. And so as you increase those levels of nutrient up to sufficiency, you see that your diseases disappear. You don't have those, those problems. Boron's also necessary for root elongation, for root movement. So if you have a boron deficiency, what happens to your root system? Okay, not nearly as much root there, and it looks like you've had a bunch of nematodes on it. Because you get what we call a witch's broom effect. Rather than the root growing out and branching and, and just extending out through the soil, the root tends to clump and it'll be just short stubs of roots and little clusters around rather than getting that long root system that can feed or, or can absorb nutrients throughout the soil. Manganese, critical for the water splitting reaction. Dr. Barnett at Cornell years ago used to have a picture of a Buddha god on the, the whole wall behind his uh, desk at Cornell University, and he labeled that image as manganese. And he had all of the world's population bowing down to this manganese here on his wall. And uh, when he was asked about that, he said, well, manganese is so important that if it wasn't for manganese, none of us would be here because we get our oxygen when manganese splits the water, the oxygen goes for us, and the hydrogen goes to combine with the carbon dioxide from the air to form the sugar. The hydrogen doesn't come from the air. The hydrogen comes from the, the water, and it requires manganese to split that water so that it's a two-sided effect. We get the energy in the sugar, and we get the oxygen through that photosystem two reaction then on it. Very important for nitrate reductase along with molybdenum. <coughs> Involved in 28 enzymes as the cofactor. And you won't farm any sugar sucrose if you don't have manganese because it's a cofactor for the uh, phosphate sucrose synthase enzyme. So if you're short on, on uh, manganese, you'll have a high concentration of uh, impure sugar. Can't think of the, the name slip, slip me right now that they use in Guatemala and the Spanish, but, but uh, uh, we call it an impure sugar essentially because it's high reducing sugars and because those, that fructose and glucose can't, haven't been combined to form the sucrose that we crystallize out. When we harvest the uh, sugar, we crystallize the sucrose and able to remove it. So manganese fits in many different areas there in the overall physiolo physiology, even though it's not a cofactor for a great number of enzymes, it's a very critical uh, part in the overall integrated physiological system. And we can look at the other nutrients, copper for our redox reactions, for our lignin, so that your plant stands rather than lodging and being uh, efficient. Manganese and copper are uh, critical in the shikimate pathway where lignin is formed, your secondary cell walls, so that you can harvest it standing rather than having to pick it up off the ground. Thank you. Uh, your iron for all of your energy relationships is very important here for redox reactions. Your molybdenum for reduc reduction of uh, nitrate, nitrogen to 
the amine farm for utilization then. You can store a lot of nitrate nitrogen without it being toxic to the plant, but it's also not usable by the plant unless it can be reduced to the amine form. So in some, several situations, we've had a very high nitrate level. The mill gets all irritated at us because they say nitrate interferes with sugar extraction, which it does. And they say, well, you've got to cut back on the nitrogen. Well, when you cut back on the nitrogen, you cut back on your growth, on your tonnage. They say, well, that's okay because it interferes with uh, sugar extraction, with the crystallization process. So, but what we found then when we analyzed for molybdenum, which quite often isn't a standard part of our analysis, found that there's no molybdenum there, bottomed out on it. And so when we add the molybdenum, we can use the nitrate nitrogen then to run those enzymes and for growth and eliminate it then as a contaminant during the processing stage uh, and use it for growth. And so molybdenum becomes an important part of that three mineral ripening uh, nutrient system that we developed there in uh, Guatemala. So nutrients, having that nutrient sufficient is very important for us. The effect of other practices on nutrient availability and two things that are really stand out would be the effect of herbicides and burning. Now when you burn, you don't, you're not feeding much material for your soil biology. You get rid of a lot of trash, it doesn't have to go through the mill, but you also are depriving then future crops of that biology that would develop if you have the organic matter and the, and the uh, energy source for them. So that the other thing with burning is that uh, you do have a quick turnover of nutrients so that it gives you a readily available source of those nutrients that are stored in that tissue for reuse. Rather than having to wait two or three years, you have it the next year for the next crop, for the ratoon crop in there. With herbicides, they're all chelators of nutrients, all mineral chelators. That's how they shut down the physiological pathway that kills the weed. So that uh, you can look at those different herbicides. This is just a short list of them. There are hundreds of herbicides out there, but every one of them are a mineral chelator. If they don't chelate, they don't shut down the pathway that will give it the herbicidal activity. Many of them are fairly limited to just one or two nutrients. Very easy to compensate for that maintain your full genetic potential, but you get some of them, <clears throat> such as your uh, uh, fluvoxanone and, and uh, your glyphosate, uh, glufosinate, are very broad spectrum chelators. That's why they kill everything. They're good broad spectrum herbicides. Shut down a uh, number of systems. Glyphosate inhibits 291 enzymes stimulates 30 others so that show, throws the balance way off. We say, well, it's specific for the EPSPS enzyme. That, that was a lie that was used to get it through the EPA because mammals don't have the EPSPS enzyme for the shikimate pathway. But there are 291 enzymes that are actually down-regulated by glyphosate. So, it's a very broad spectrum chelator. And so if your soil is short in any of those nutrients, there's some real compensation that you need to do to maintain your yield potential. It's also a registered, patented antibiotic. But it's an antibiotic against the beneficial organisms that would make iron and manganese available and stimulates those organisms that make manganese and iron uh, 
unavailable in the soil through that MN4 plus uh, oxidation. So if you look at your herbicides, and I mentioned the one new one that uh, we used in Guatemala that turned the plants white, albinos, that we weren't familiar with what it chelated. And as soon as we got that analysis back and realized what was going on, we could compensate for it. We could uh, get our yield potential restored. Otherwise, it would have sat there for another three or four weeks that we wouldn't have seen that uh, extra growth or that uh, production. So we can look at the different herbicides, for instance. Uh, uh, this is Flumoxa Zen that, Mon that uh, Maria has analyzed and looked at and you can compensate for those nutrients, again, that, that are uh, chelated and restore that genetic potential that the plant has that would be compromised by that particular uh, herbicide. So I'll just go through some of these with diuron. You can see that effect on, on uh, root growth from the chelation of of the nutrients. Here's with uh, isoflute hole uh, <clears throat> there and the uh, symptom as well as the uh, general stunning that then occurs. You see with glyphosate and that broad spectrum chelation, the need to uh, compensate or modify our environmental conditions so that we can maintain that uh, full productive potential. Now in our label in the states it says that it's safe to apply glyphosate anytime before emergence of, of the plant. In Israel it says it's not safe to, to plant for up to three weeks after you apply glyphosate because it takes about three weeks in most of their soils before Glyphosate is detoxified by chelation with your calcium and magnesium and iron and uh, other minerals in the soil. So that it's detoxified as an herbicide, but it's not necessarily degraded. Your geological survey and uh, surveying soils in the Midwest and in Florida finds that there's as much as two ton of glyphosate that is accumulated in those soils now that's still sitting there. It's never been degraded. And uh, CSIRO in Australia has been analyzing for residual glyphosate in their soils and they find that they can account for 20 years of glyphosate application still sitting in the soil as either AMPA or glyphosate AMPA is one and a half times more toxic than the glyphosate. It's not a readily degraded element, chemical, because it's a synthetic amino acid and we haven't had years of evolution or that to develop or selective pressure to develop organisms that can degrade it like we have for oil spills and some of those other uh, factors. But so if you plant early, there's some research of uh, Rom Held and, and uh, his group in Germany, if you plant a day or two after you've applied a burn down application on, for wheat or barley, it delays emergence uh, for a week or two. But then those plants, as they start to emerge, you can see the tip die back on the, on the wheat and barley, typical of copper deficiency. On sugar cane, you get little blotching with copper deficiency on the leaf. On wheat, the tip of the leaf, and you'll see this also once in a while with sugar cane under severe copper deficiency. But you see the severe chlorosis from sulfur and from nitrogen deficiency. You see the streaking on the leaf from zinc and manganese deficiency. Symptoms are all there. If you ask an agronomist, why that plant is kind of stunted and slow growing, you'll say, well, we have too much residue on the soil surface or we have dry soils or too wet a soil or some other excuse because 
they don't connect the dots between the herbicide and the symptom that they're seeing. And those are conditions that can also tie up or minimize the availability of some of our nutrients. So a study that we did in, in uh, Guatemala, uh, again, you can see glyphosate's very systemic, readily moves in the phloem system of the plant. That's the purpose of that phosphonate part of it. And within six hours, we had over a hundred times more glyphosate in the stock of the sugarcane plant than would be required to chelate all of the unbound cations in the plant. That continues to accumulate for about two days and then it starts to drop off. But the importance of knowing this is that you see that within that six hour period, We've tied up 90 to 95% of our iron and our manganese. It's required for photosynthesis and for all of those other enzymatic processes. We're asking the, the plant to run on 5% of its energy, of its uh, potential there. 30% drop in zinc in that, just that six hour period and then that continues right on out so that if you're putting it out as a ripener, that last four weeks or, or so is a prime time for when that factory should be working full speed for you to store sugar in the stock. Not a time when you want to deprive it of those nutrients that are critical for photosynthesis and sugar formation and movement. And so you can see the effect of burning also on that, on the biology, uh, with that significant burning and the soil temperatures that are developed, that also influences the actual biology that's going to be required down the road in your uh, additional ratoon crops, uh, because you're utilizing all of those nutrients initially in your impacting your soil biology. Uh, if we look at soil analysis recommendations for the macronutrients, then we can see that for nitrogen, we base that, uh, modify our requirement then based on our organic matter content in the soil because we're going to uh, have a lower uh, nitrogen response with our uh, higher organic matter because it's going to influence that availability and provide some of that nitrogen so that we would modify our nitrogen requirement uh, based on that sufficiency level based on the amount of percent of our organic matter in the soil. So we're looking at the overall system not just focusing on a silver bullet or two, but we're looking at how do we manage this ecology that uh, is going to give us the return and greater expression of that genetic potential of this plant. And that's one of the reasons why you're here at this regeneration conference is how do we really focus on that potential uh, and maximize that potential that we're given in that seed or in that uh, clone, <coughs> clone here. And so we will recognize the source of nitrogen from organic matter and its influence on <coughs> nitrification and nitrogen stability in the soil so that we may have a cover crop or we may have a, a pre-crop and many of our crops with sugar cane we're developing, <coughs> we're developing uh, cover crops that don't compete with the cane but that are very low growing, capable of inhibiting nitrification so that we have that stability of the ammonium form of nitrogen that uh, is maintained in the ammonium form be, rather than being converted to nitrate, which in your soils is about a seven day period. 
that if you put out ammonium, it's going to be nitrate nitrogen. Well, then nitrate nitrogen, very water soluble and leach, leaches where your ammonium is captured on your soil colloids. And nitrate nitrogen also denitrifies. So you lose it volatil from volatilization loss as well as from leaching. So with cover crops or with nitrification inhibitors, we can stabilize that nitrogen to greatly improve our nitrogen efficiency. Phosphorus is a very high correlation depending on the analysis uh, method, but with Malik 3 and Olson and resin extraction there, but uh, we modify our phosphorus uh, applications based on our uh, phosphorus levels in the soil, what's available, what's extractable, uh, and also on the soil's phosphorus fixation potential. So that some of the soils, when you apply nitrogen, it may be fixed very readily and you're not going to see much response from it. In our situation with our hog farmers in the Midwest, they wanted to reduce the amount of phosphorus that was being applied in the crops so they could reduce the phosphorus level, but still using it to feed their animals, or hogs especially. And most of that phosphorus that's in the plant is as a phytase. And so they figured that if they put a phytase enzyme in with the feed, it would break that bonding and uh, release the phosphorus for, from a nutritional standpoint, which it does very, very well, increases the efficiency of that phosphorus 30, 40%. The problem is that they use a very stable phytase enzyme that goes right through the pig into the manure, and then as they apply the manure, that phytase is still active in the soil, and most of your soil phosphorus is stored as a phytase phosphorus, or a, a phytophosphorus, so that when this enzyme goes out in the manure, you start releasing all of the phosphorus that's in your soil then as a pollutant going downstream. So that uh, sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot when we uh, jump on the bandwagon without looking downstream a little bit, what we can do. So that, again, the other thing we see with glyphosate that influences phosphorus is within two weeks after we have applied glyphosate as a ripening agent, we have killed our mycorrhizae on the stalk. Mycorrhizae are critical for uptake of phosphorus in phosphorus limiting conditions. Also for the uptake of zinc and manganese. It's well known for phosphorus and zinc, we find the same thing with manganese. So if that mycorrhizae is able to extract and cover a lot more of the soil than the root system is, and you have to have manganese and phosphorus within two millimeter of the root in order for the plant to find it and to be able to use it. You also see the stimulation of the manganese oxidizers, and the roots become black. Well, that black is calcium manganese phosphate precipitate, or burnicide, that is biologically oxidized manganese that then with the calcium and phosphorus precipitates out as an insoluble, uh, previously, Nit nutrient source. Look at potassium again. We modify that, our rate of potassium based on what our residual potassium availability is. And just mention that as we go through some of these other uh, nutrients. We use leaf analysis primarily for our micronutrients. Uh, we don't have a good soil analysis for uh, manganese, because manganese is so dynamically driven by the soil biology that you can have 
uh, a level in the soil that you would say would be toxic to any plant, and yet none of it available because it's all in the MN4 plus form as either manganese phosphate or manganese uh, calcium manganese phosphate in most of our soils there. So we use the leaf analysis for our recommendations, especially early on. And it's important that we make those, meet those needs with the micronutrients early on to capture as much of that genetic potential as possible. Really important to mine the gap, to close that gap between what we're producing and what the genetic potential of that plant is. So that we'll generally sample within one month after uh, uh, application, and then uh, usually that will be at about three months, and then sample again a month after the application. And then we can make correction for any deficiencies that we didn't provide in that earlier application. So we can look at those micronutrients and what we're using. You can see the range there of sufficiency levels for the different micronutrients and then the rates that would be required uh, to meet those needs. So that to correct, uh, correct it, for instance, to move it up, we could use manganese sulfate or zinc sulfate as sources or sodium uh, borate, copper sulfate, and this if you need the sulfate. If you don't need the sulfate, you could use the other salts on that, or you could modify the environment. And I mentioned we use water management to manage manganese. The problem is that we're short enough on manganese in most of those soils that they try and tend to keep the water almost at saturation most of the time. Well, roots have to have oxygen for root growth. How do they get water? Oxygen in the soil. You get it as that water moves down, it sucks the oxygen down with it. As you fill it with water then, you have a time there where it's more anaerobic condition and that's where you get your manganese reduction so that it's available for uptake. But if you keep it anaerobic all the time, roots are struggling for oxygen, they're just kind of huffing and puffing all the time uh, rather than being able to have enough oxygen. So it's a balance relationship there. And you can see those materials. So again, closing the gaps that our commercial data, over 20,000 hectare in Guatemala, now for two consecutive years, shows that on average 8 to 10 percent of the potential biomass production is compromised by a micronutrient deficiency in the first months of growth, that first two to three months. So that you're gaining 8 to 10 percent additional yield potential if you'll address those uh, critical needs right from the start. Make sure that it's not deficient uh, right along. Uh, so that uh, even when a complete NPKS program is used based on soil analysis, that uh, tissue analysis provides that additional information, especially for the micronutrients, that has a big impact then on our overall production efficiency in closing those nutritional gaps uh, on it. Uh, takes us two to three weeks to get a tissue analysis back from most of our labs. I assume you're probably similar to that. In Brazil, it's about 10 days, but much more use of it in Brazil, so they've uh, ramped up a little more. But that's a long period of time by the time you get a sample collected. And uh, there's some new tools that are becoming available to us. And one of those is this portable X-ray fluorescence mineral analysis analyzer. I mentioned that started work on this technique about 30 years ago at Brookhaven Laboratories. The equipment that I used then cost $5 billion, the synchrotron. 
not something that you're going to have in your kitchen or in a uh, uh, general laboratory. This instrument's still expensive relative to farming. It's about $35,000, but again, it will give you all of the minerals from sodium to uh, uranium on the periodic table so that you essentially have all but two of your essential nutrients that you get, and it only takes 30 seconds to give you that information. Doesn't require preparation time, extraction. You just put a dry leaf or a wet leaf or a powder over the beam line, and in 30 seconds, you have all of your minerals. Really a phenomenal tool. My wife said it when I first started working on with the Bruker instrument here, she said I was worse than a kid waiting to open his Christmas present. That it was, uh, I was having so much fun <clears throat> there in that process because we could do things then in a timely basis that we couldn't do otherwise. We we're always too late, especially when you're focused on improving that ripening stage, getting everything we can in, into storage. And so the system works on an x-ray beam. It's about 10 pounds. You can put it on the back of a tailgate of a pickup if you want, or pull it out and, and uh, uh, set it up on a little stand. The x-ray beam goes up and uh, uh, hits the material knocks an electron out, and each element has that electron ring around the atom, and then it will count how many electrons are being hit. That's directly proportional to the uh, concentration of that mineral. Uh, so again, in about 30 seconds, you have all of the, almost all of the information that you need then to make those corrections does need proper calibration, and your different matrix will influence it, but you can do SAP analysis, you can do soil analysis, or you can do uh, tissue analysis. <clears throat> Dry, wet, uh, anywhere in there. And again, it gives you a spectrum, and <clears throat> the counts then will tell you how much mineral is actually there. Uh, Bruker estimates within five or six years, this will probably be the standard for most of our laboratories uh, doing tissue analysis for agriculture. You don't have to worry about extraction, you don't have to worry about disposal of, of materials or anything else, and you get it in a timely manner. So, uh, uh, some really exciting things to tools that are coming on that give us the opportunity to mine that gap, to bring that gap closer together and more related to the uh, uh, actual functional aspects of the plant. So in conclusion, all nutrients uh, must be present in a complete nutritional program for sugar cane. Uh, you can run a car on a flat tire, but it doesn't run nearly as efficiently. Uh, or on three cylinders rather than four or six, but not as efficiently. And we want to optimize our production efficiency. To do that, you need that balanced nutrition. Soil and leaf analysis are crucial to close the nutritional gap, to really verify where we are. You'll have a good idea on where you stand with most of the uh, major nutrients because you've been applying different rates and different watching that response, but especially for the micronutrients, you haven't paid as much attention to those. And so the tissue analysis and soil analysis are important. There are, are other agronomic practices impact the nutrient availability for the sugar cane and especially the herbicide application and selection, your uh, cover cropping and other things can be a powerful tool for you. If you'll look at those
their impact then on that physio physiology and biology that's influencing nutrient availability. And then we have some of these new tools. Now we were especially interested in Guatemala and in the glyphosate applied as a ripener. Uh, you get about a three-tenths of a percent increase in sugar yield in the immediate year, sometimes a little more than that. By stopping that tiller growth as the glyphosate accumulates in the, in the buds. But then you take a beating in the ratoon crop and the later crop. And so we were interested just from that standpoint of finding a more efficient ripener than glyphosate. And you have modus, you have eth uh, ethrel and a few other materials that have been used and that that aren't as damaging as glyphosate. But the other reason we we're very concerned was the end stage kidney failure. Glyphosate really triggers end stage kidney failure. Now it's a chronic effect. Doesn't happen overnight or with one application, but very serious concern, especially in Central America and Sri Lanka, other areas where they use glyphosate as a ripener because of the increasing incidence of end stage kidney failure. And in that capacity, there are also a number of other diseases that are influenced in a similar manner. If you look at the epidemiological pattern in the Center for Disease Control, you will see this pattern for every one of these 34 diseases. What this pattern is, is the incidence of disease, of the chronic disease, and most of these, relative to the curve also being the curve for the dietary exposure and <laughs> environmental exposure to glyphosate. So if you dissect it, you see two curves. You see one slope going this way on out, which would be from 1974 to 1996. And then from 1996, you see that large increase then uh, with the five to 15 fold increase in application of glyphosate with the Roundup Ready crops. And so if we look at the actual data, this is what you see for those different diseases. So that there's an eight to 10 year lag in the medical data with the actual graphing and being able to graph that data. But you see in all of those diseases, you see that early increase in incidence of disease with the direct application or exposure to glyphosate and then that tremendous increase that is continuing now so that some have predicted that in 10 to 20 years we will probably see the greatest mass depopulation in the world that's ever been historically recorded as a result of the continued indiscriminate use of this compound. We have uh, in Central America as well as in the U.S. and other areas with that. This is just the CDC data with the USDA data on uh, end-stage kidney failure relative to glyphosate used on corn and soybean. You see those one in four in El Salvador sugarcane workers, and it's primarily a problem with a disease of sugarcane workers because of that exposure through the ripening process. They're not there and for three or four weeks after the glyphosate's applied, but it accumulates in the stalk, and you'll watch, and with the machete, they'll cut off a sharp chunk of stalk and chew it for the sugar, and it's loaded with glyphosate. You see it coming through, some also in the sugar, so that uh, the research of just mania here and in Sri Lanka was selected as the most important scientific paper that we had last year selected by the American uh, Association of, of Scientists. 
as the most important scientific paper connecting the dots between the ripening of rice and the end-stage kidney failure in that area. So that uh, in the U.S., 20 people die per day waiting for a kidney transplant. Uh, we don't have enough kidneys to go around. Certainly in the developing countries, you see more, even greater impact there. Uh, so we looked at ways to meet the needs of the farmer, to develop uh, a nutritional program or an alternative program less damaging process than the glyphosate. We, we knew that we needed to get rid of the nitrate nitrogen. We wanted to use that for sugar production. Powerful tool, num number one element as far as your ultimate yield is going to be there, but can also be a contaminant as nitrate nitrogen that's going to interfere with sugar extraction and reduce your, your harvestable product there. To do that, we needed some molybdenum. We needed to be able to move that sugar efficiently, especially at that stage of growth where the plant wants to move it in, in towards the reproductive stage. We want to keep it moving into the stock for storage. We do use boron for that. We also want to make sure that photosynthesis is really perking along. We don't have a general magnesium deficiency, or we would have included it in a couple areas we do, but we needed the manganese. And so far, a kilogram of solubore, about 200 milligram of, of uh, boron, 200 milligram of manganese, and 200 milligram of, of molybdenum, Last year, 19, or 2019, we produced 31,000 ton more sugar, refined sugar, at 8% less input cost with the nutritional approach with those three nutrients than we did with the glyphosate comparison. The year previous, the first year that we shifted, I don't have the tonnage differences there, but uh, the mill said they made three and a half million dollars more with the nutrient ripener than they did. This is on uh, 20,000 hectare, about 50,000 acres. So that we knew that we didn't, uh, you can't afford to compromise your, your yield, your harvest, we needed a system, though, that could m interact and make these four points of the, the ecological diamond work for you from a productive and a, and a, a health standpoint rather than uh, taking away from it. And so we focused on those nutrient processes that would give us that benefit uh, without giving us the, the damage. The 8% less input cost was a lot. We didn't have to go in and fill in some of the gaps where the glyphosate had killed the bud and we didn't get a regeneration during the uh, ratoon stage. So uh, again, we can do that if we'll look at those systems and remember that we need to mine that gap to make that uh, process as efficiently and effective as we can, utilizing the plant and the natural environment and blessings that we've received in, in those capacities in our management e efforts. So thank you for the opportunity to share the research of uh, Dr. Fernandez, Maria Fernandez, uh, here. and. Uh, also to be a part of your your program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. John Hilbert.